So, here you guys are going through a lot of labs and exams, some of you. Thanks for showing up today. We're going to talk about lung sounds. So I said we're going to talk about sounds in general, but there's more to talk about with lungs. Than just, uh, so we'll, we'll, I'm splitting it up a little bit. Uh, last time we talked about the colors of the body, mostly comes from melanin, blood, uh, uh, and some carotenoids. We talked about some of the apps that you can use that are based off the sun. So <coughs> go, eat, go eat the sun instead of being, being hit by sun. Um, so we're going to talk about sound. Uh, does anyone speak French? How do you say that guy's name? René So there's like two dots or beating that means anything. So Yeah, So uh, he said people need to have this is translated obviously. People need to have things trumpeted in their ears several times and from all directions. The first sound pricks up the ear, the second sound shakes it, and the third it goes in. That was back in 1821. We're going to talk more about this guy and why this is kind of pertinent. But, uh, so we're talking about sound. And we're going to specifically talk about uh, breathing and motor sounds. So, a, so uh, you know what I keep saying about when you first come in to do an examination of any sort, whether it's a person or a thing, you need to think about the general impression. So when you're thinking about someone's breathing, what's your general impression about their breathing when they first come to work? Can you hear them? Most people you can't really hear most people sitting next to them that are breathing, right? Because most people don't have a breathing issue. Sometimes people are a little bit louder for various different reasons. It's not necessarily pathological. But there are some diseases that are very loud just sitting in the room with someone. Um, obviously, snoring is one of those, right? You know, if anyone's lived with someone who snores all that, you would know that. And that's, I'm not really going to talk about that today. Um, but there's some uh, more pathological conditions where uh, really, you can hear them across the room. You can hear them outside of them sometimes. So that's, you just need to be aware of that. And then how people talk. I'm not going to really talk about that. There's some some infections. Uh, they talk about a hot potato boy sometimes when someone gets an infection. In their, some kids get an infection in the, the uh, soft tissue around their little uh, cavity. And people start talking about, ooh, 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 ooh. It's like a hot potato in their mouth. Like they have a hot potato in their mouth. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that either, but you got to think about these things when you need something. How, it's, how the general sound is. Um, specifically, though, today I want to talk about percussion and auscultation. Percussion, if you think of percussion instruments, that just means tapping, right? Um, auscultation just means listening. You know, these are fancy words that uh, people derived from Latin back in the day. Uh, a lot of them from this guy, Leonek. So, uh, with regard to my overall schema for the physical exam, um, the respiration rate, that's what R R stands for. Uh, people tend to breathe 15, 20 breaths per minute. Typically, they breathe about four times slower than what their heart beats. So, people's heart range, a normal heart range is 60 to 100, goes faster if you're exercising. Um, sometimes you get down in the 50s when you're asleep, and that's all normal range. Divide that by four, that's typically what most people tend to bring in the respiration rate. When someone comes in the room, they're like, they're like, there's something wrong. This guy's either running or there's something really wrong. Or they're breathing really slowly when they're starting to move. I mean, you know, there's something wrong with the respira respiration tract. And so you think about these things. And that's one of the vitals, one of the, <coughs> typically talk about four vitals, temperature, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, and the pulse ox that we talked about last time is kind of being called the fifth vital, but it's not usually the vital that has been recorded throughout the last 100, 200 years. Um, more specifically, we're going to talk about the respiratory component of the physical exam. So we kind of talked about this already, the quality of the voice, the breathing rate, whether or not you can hear them. So uh, physicians start saying, I want to know more than what just the patient tells me. I want to start figuring things out that uh, the patient themselves doesn't know. There used to be, you know, a physician just said, just listen to the patient's complaints. And that's great, but there's some things that people just don't know about their own bodies. And so percussion is actually one of the more the first ways to do that, ways to uh, investigate the inside of a person that the person can't feel. And, uh, and this is from a, a Frenchman who uh, said, according to a German physician to the chest, this is in 1782, so this is still relatively recent in the history of 
of uh, mankind, right? So uh, this is a novel thing this Frenchman noticed uh, from this German physician. If the chest is covered with a simple shirt, if the chest covered with a simple shirt is struck to the hand, it gives a dull sound on the side where the vomit is. He's talking about like a fluid clutch. As if one was striking a flesh piece, whereas if the chest opposite side is struck, it gives back a resonant sound as if one was striking a drum. However, I still doubt that this information is generally correct. So he was still dubious because this is still in development. And it really started with this Austrian guy. So this moved from Austria to Germany down to France. Um, he was uh, a physician. He actually worked for about seven years at this hospital, the Spanish military hospital in Vienna. If you know much about the Austrian Hungarian Empire, you know that they're like the Spanish, weird Habsburg stuff going on. Anyway, uh, he was a physician, but he was a part time musician and son of an innkeeper. And he was treating patients. He was volunteering for free at this hospital like, for seven years. He was working. Um, free, I guess. Um, and he started thinking, you know, people's chests aren't that much different than the wine barrels that my dad used to knock on to see if they're for, right? You can imagine if a half empty wine keg is sitting there, you can knock on it and hear where the, the line is, where it, falls, where it is. And so he's like, well, why don't I do that? And so uh, he started tapping on people. Uh, we'll talk about that, what, what he was doing. But uh, he published a 95 page. Uh, track like on the subject. And it's basically lost. Like no one paid attention to it. No one knew about it. But somehow it ended up in the hands of Napoleon's physician, uh, Korsovar, I think his name. Um, and uh, along with many things <coughs> involved in Napoleon, uh, uh, it came disseminated that way. Like, uh, like all the different physicians around Europe started hearing about it because Napoleon's physician was doing these, this weird tapping. And so they started doing it. It took off with a lot of fire. In some ways, uh, revolutionized medicine at that time. Um, yeah, if anyone's curious, I can talk to you about why Napoleon is the father of engineering, too. So, uh, Napoleon was involved in a lot of different, uh, or his influence uh, uh, changed the world in many different ways, other than just the political. Um, so, percussion. Uh, what you need is a plexometer to do indirect. Percussion. You can do direct percussion, and you don't get a nice sound. So you can tap your chest like this. You don't really get a great sound when you do it. You, you can hear it because you're close to it. But how, try tapping on your clavicle, your collar. You hear that kind of resonant sound? Let your fingers bounce off because you're trying to make like a drum. So you're using the clavicle as kind of like the drumstick on the drum of your lung. So the top part of your lung is about the apex of your lung, so you can actually hear. Like if you had fluid collected up there for some, whatever reason, you'd get a dull sound. So um, initially, people were using uh, like they use a piece of wood. Actually, ivory turned out to be pretty good. So they have on their stethoscopes. We'll talk about stethoscopes later. They would have these pieces of ivory tied to them so they wouldn't lose them. But eventually, they realized that uh, they were just losing them anyway. And your finger works just as well. So you're trained to use a middle finger. So that's not supposed to mean anything, but uh, uh, it's just like a nice sturdy finger. And what you do, is you take your middle finger, and you want contact to be just this joint right here, your distal, it's called your distal interphalangeal joint. You want your contact there, so you, you kind of arch that finger, I don't know if you can tell, I'm trying not to get uh, vulgar, but um, you arch that finger there so that you get that joint just against the surface that you want to uh, percuss. And then you stack right on that joint. And so you can do it on yourself, it's not as satisfying, but uh, you can tap around, tap on your stomach, and you can kind of get a more resonant sound than if you do, we talked on the first lecture about tapping through your liver, so you can tap right here, get that rebound, as you move up, you get more of a dullness over your liver, and then you move up higher, it gets more resonant, more so than what your abdomen is, that's your lung. Um, so for the lung exam, what they're looking for is fluid collections. So you can get fluid built up more for various different reasons. We'll talk a little bit more as we go through the lecture today about various different reasons. But uh, since you're looking for fluid collection and or a collapsed lung, sometimes the lung collapses and so it'll sound solid, there's no more air floating around to be nice and resonant. Um, so why does that work? So in sound production, you got a certain amount of energy, right? So this tap, certain amount of energy that you're imparting, you're uh, transferring from your finger 
into the medium that you're hitting. And so the energy, of course, is proportionate to the amplitude times the frequency, right? And so different media will have transfer uh, uh, different frequencies better than others. So uh, if you had lots of air, air is easy to move, so you can have a big amplitude and low frequency will pass through. If you have a solid, it's hard to move solid atoms, right? So smaller amplitude, higher, uh, 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 lower frequency. Wait, I wrote that wrong. Higher amplitude, lower frequency. Yeah, that should be high frequency. Sorry, greater amplitude and higher frequency for. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I had it right, right here. So this is the big comparison. This is when you have more air. Right. Two, I'm going to slide. So uh, higher frequencies in solids with lower amplitudes. So that's why you get that duller sound because it's a higher frequency, higher note, higher pitch, but it's more muffled. The sound's not being transferred. Um, if you had uh, a bunch of air, like so you can have a lung collapse and it gets solid, but then you can have air around it. And so that's actually pure air as opposed to lung, which is not actually a balloon, it's more like a sponge. So if your lung collapses and there's air around it, then it's going to sound much more like a drum than your lung usually does. And so um, you can do it like on your puff sheet, like take your puff sheet and tap like we were doing. Hear more of that resonant sound. That's what like a drop lung might sound like a pneumothorax. Is what, I'm sorry, that's what a pneumothorax is. Because emphysema is where uh, the lung spaces, like I mentioned, that the lung is more like a sponge, actually, kind of like almost like a foam. And the bubbles in the foam or the sponge, um, there's a certain surface tension associated with that. And people have to, just some, some disorders will change that surface tension, and those bubbles in your lung can actually grow. So you have these big, what we call bullae, uh, balls of air. And so that will make a more hyper-resonant sound if you tap on something's lung. Um, what else about sound before we go on? So we know about Mach 1, speed of, air, uh, speed of sound in air. We talked about a lot. We talked a little less about the speed of sound in fluids or uh, solids. Uh, sound travels faster in solids. That's in part to what I was talking about with uh, lower amplitude and greater frequency, it's related to that. Um, and in part, to the, it's also because there's a certain amount of stiffness to the materials. You have uh, shear waves and also pressure or compression waves that are in solids. So, uh, but anyway, fundamental thing to remember, and I have to remember the complicated equation for the solids, but just remember the speed of sound is going to be proportionate to the square root of the modulus over the density. If you look at the units, it's easy to remember because the units of a, the modulus is pascals or kilogram per meter per second squared, right? You divide out uh, density out of that, you're going to get meter squared over second squared, and square root of that meters per second. So um, that's a quick and easy thing to remember for any kind of uh, like FD exam or something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's part of the reason why sound travels faster in salt. And that, plays into when we'll talk about ultrasound. We'll talk more about it later. So, uh, kind of review again. If you have uh, a resonant note you're getting at the normal lung, it's going to be hyper resonant if you have more air in the lung. It's going to be more dull if you're with something solid like your liver or production of fluid in your lung. Um, so, that's percussion, and that kind of dominated field of medicine for a while, but auscultation or listening directly instead of percussing actually existed before that. Uh, uh, there's old Egyptian papyri, there's the uh, Hindi Vedas, the Sanskrit Vedas out of India, there's Hippocrates, uh, they talk about actually listening directly to someone's chest. Like you stick your ear up against there's pictures of, of, uh, of all the way up into like the 1700s, physicians stick their head right up against someone's chest and, uh, and listening to the sounds of the here. Um, but when percussion showed up, people went, oh, I don't have to stick my head against a sick person's chest. Great. You know? Uh, so they started tapping the finger. Plus, you know, it, 
there is some rigor to the percussion and they could kind of quantify it and characterize it in ways that they did. Because then other people would hear too. Like when I percuss, if it's quiet and we're all standing around a patient and I'm tapping on them, you could hear what I'm doing and there's, there's a consensus of what everyone's hearing. So that, that's part of the reason percussion as well. Um, and also there's just bats happen in medicine just as much as anywhere else. So percussion took off in the 1700s, 1800s because this uh, Austrian innkeeper son. Um, but uh, in 1816, uh, uh, Leonek uh, was asked to examine, this is, this is the true story, he was, uh, apparently, uh, he was asked to examine a young, somewhat endowed woman. And he was a little prudish about it and didn't want to uh, percuss her chest. Uh, didn't feel that uh, she was endowed enough, he didn't feel it would be that useful. But uh, the alternative was listening directly with his ear against her chest, and he thought that would be a little modest and inappropriate, and he didn't want to go do that. And so uh, he'd made wood flutes in the past, and so he, he thought, well, I can just I'll try messing around with a tube. And so he rolled up a tube and listened through a tube and heard very distinct sounds that he could vocalize to different parts of the chest in ways that uh, you couldn't really vocalize by just sticking your head up and something and listening through your ear. And so he loved it. He thought it was great. He didn't have to touch the patient. Um, it didn't seem to help him because, ironically, although he became like father of pulmonary medicine in some ways, he died of tuberculosis. But uh, he, he thought he was helping himself, his own health. He didn't have to touch the patients. And so he started carrying around the tube. He made it out, uh, made a wooden, he called it a cylinder at the time, used it constantly for three years. And from that three years of constantly using it, he published this two-volume text that basically redefined pulmonary medicine at that time. Um, he used it so much that students called him a cylinder maniac. Which is kind of funny. Uh, that's a picture of him uh, using it with a, a small toy. And essentially, and that's a, a pictures of what the device was, you can see like his flute-making uh, abilities uh, kind of uh, were utilized in and screwed together, but essentially it's just a tube. And that's essentially what a stethoscope is today. We don't call it a cylinder, we call it a stethoscope that's great for inspector of chest, I guess. Um, the translator, the first English translator of his work uh, said that the stethoscope will come in general use, notwithstanding its value, I'm extremely doubtful, because its beneficial application requires much time and gives a great deal of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner because its whole hue and character is foreign and opposed to our habits and associations. It must be confessed that there is something even ludicrous in the picture of a great physician actually listening through a long tube to a patient's thorax as if the disease of man or a living being that communicates conditions to the sense without. So there's this idea at the time that, uh, again, you talk to the patient, you listen to them talk about their disease, you didn't really listen to their body. You didn't like actually examine the body. And this, the, the invention of the stethoscope was the first step into turning patients into just inanimate objects that physicians examine with non destructive techniques. And that, that's an ongoing kind of conflict that, you know, that physicians often have. But we don't want to like, treat humans <laughs> as inanimate objects, but often that sometimes the impression a patient might get when they see them. But, um, uh, but this attitude that you couldn't listen to the body itself and come up with a diagnosis was still. In, pre in place in this time period. And uh, Dr. Forbes had no idea what the future would bring and that stethoscopes would become synonymous with the position. So the stethoscope is just a conduit of sound from the chest to the ears. Uh, it does selectively, not on purpose, just how it does uh, amplify specific frequencies, um, particularly low ones, which is all right for cardiac sounds, for heart sounds, we'll talk about that. Uh, um, but for lung sounds, you get some higher pitch ones, and so they kind of get drowned out sometimes. And there's lots of different lung sounds. I'll talk about that. But in some ways, people describe it as listening to a crowd of people whisper and trying to pick out one conversation. I mean, it's hard. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate that. It's hard enough that, like, some studies suggest that uh, uh, if you get a bunch of physicians uh, to listen to the same patients, about 25% of the time they disagree. So, there's a fair amount of noise in the diagnosis. All right, let's see if this works right without making a lot of feedback. 
<coughs> this is my self native electronic stethoscope. I'm going to try to demonstrate how hard it is. So there's a lot of noise picked up by the mic just by bumping it. And so those are kind of the louder noises that I'm going to try to ignore. I'm not picking it up. I just didn't know when no one was in the room. It's too much noise, I guess. <coughs> so you can hear, this is an example, just me touching the stethoscope makes noise. And that is not just the mic, that happens with a regular stethoscope too. So you can hear all this random noise and it's not even what you're looking for. I can barely hear it. So we're going to stop doing that. And we will go to what a recording is sounds like. So this is what a normal person's breath sounds look like, right? Called in and help. and all the other sounds that are taken out. So there's three <laughs> categories of sounds. So there's the normal breath sounds. So there's air moving through your trachea. Uh, there's what we call adventitious lung sounds. Um, and then there's transmitted sounds from your voice, your larynx. Yeah. So is the 25% difference you mentioned a difference in what they're hearing based on like the physiology of the doctor, or is it a difference of opinion of what it's a sound means? Okay. So, so I'll go through more of the different sounds, and you'll hear like how some of them sound very similar. And I'll talk a little bit about the terminology as well. So that's also a problem, how people name the things or something. About. Have they ever looked at the impact of the difference of opinion? Is it is it meaningful to patient outcome, or is it is nowadays it more less nuanced? so, less so in the late eighteen hundreds, more so. So the next revolution probably in pulmonary medicine is the X-ray. So uh, and that happened in the eighteen hundreds. Matt and Curie, right? So Matt and Curie, get the exact year. I'll have to look that up again, but uh, I do remember. That Madame Curie started playing around with radium and such, and within like a year or two, I think it was, I think it may have been a year, but it was within two years, uh, someone tried it, tried radiation for a medical application. Like it's like used to be nowadays, new materials and stuff like that. The first applications like in sports equipment, right? It used to be, I think, people new material, new technology. What's the first application? Let's use it on a human. <laughs> But uh, now with uh, you know medical ethics and clinical trials and things like that, there's a little bit more lag between the discovery and the application with humans. Um, so the, my point was is uh, X-rays have standardized diagnosis for lung disorders. So you know often what happens with the stethoscope is that's like the first clue, and then you go, well, let's get an X-ray, and they have portable X-ray machines that will wheel into the patient's room in the hospital. Or there's common enough that a lot of doctors' offices have 
And so uh, you're something where you're like, let's get an x ray. You get the x ray and then you go from that. From that kind of just standard of those things. But yeah, if you, took, if, you took 100, if you took 10 patients and had uh, uh, 10 physicians listen to each of them, yeah, you get like a 25% of the patients that would be disagreeing about the diagnosis. <coughs> So, yeah, it is a small issue, but uh, um, for the most part, I, I would also, it would also depend on the, what disease the patient had to do. Like, I think the more common diseases, you have less disagreement with, the more rare diseases, which <coughs> physician, an average physician may or may not have heard very often, there would be more disagreement with them. So I don't know the data from where I got that number, what, what kind of disease they had. Um, so, breath sounds, like the normal breath sounds that uh, we have, there's three modes of flow, right? This is easy stuff for engineering, a little bit more difficult for medical students. Uh, laminar flow versus turbulent flow, and you kind of get something in between when you get edges. So, the, the uh, more it goes, you know, you get these vortices from like a difficult, tortuous, or branch. And so the lung, uh, you know, he starts out with the trachea, one windpipe. You know, you can feel your trachea up here underneath your voice box. That's your trachea. It's, a, it's bound by cartilage. That's why it's like kind of hard. It's essentially just a tube. Cartilaginous tube goes down and it divides into two bronchi, and then they divide up into bronchioli, and then they divide up into alveoli. And the alveoli are the smallest divisions of the lung. They're the little balls that I was talking about, and they're very small. They're small enough that diffusion is the dominant transport mechanism. So that's a pretty small size, right? Uh, we talk about x equals square root dt, you know, but like the small size of the alveoli really allow diffusion to be the dominant way for gas to be transported. So that's why the need is so small. Because you're trying to get oxygen into the blood. And you want high surface of volume, so you have this small little ball surrounded by like essentially blood. So in a lot of ways, the lungs are just balls of air in the sack of blood. But uh, the point about the getting to the alveoli is you got the, bron the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioli. And, uh, and so you have a lot of divisions as they keep dividing into a smaller and smaller passageway. And, and you go from large passageway to small passageway. And so that changes the fluid flow, right? So you have the same mass flow, but when you're dividing up the passageways smaller and smaller, the velocity in the smaller passages, because there's lots of them, uh, is much less than the velocity that you get in the trachea. Right? And because passageways are much smaller, then you get um, changes in how, whether it's laminar or not. So what, what's the quick way to decide and uh, to find out if something's laminar versus turbulent flow, knowing the geometry and the velocity and their properties? Reynolds. Yeah, the Reynolds number. So uh, Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces, so the air, uh, the forces that are pushing the air through and the viscous forces. The, the, Forces that try and keep the air together to interact with the, the surfaces of the, whatever the air is going by. And so <clears throat> with the tube, you have uh, this, this middle equation is probably the most important. That's the kinematic uh, viscosity, you have your velocity, and this is the diameter of your tube. That's probably the simplest way to look at it. And so you can see as the velocity increases, as the diameter increases, you're going to get more turbulence. So in the trachea, Large velocity because all the air is coming through the trachea um, and large diameter, it's going to be more turbulent than when you're down into the smallest bronchioli going to the alveoli, uh, where this passageway is small and the velocity is less because it's all the air has been divided up going to all the different places at one. And so, turbulence that's the key thing turbulence makes noise. Okay, so when we were, li when we were listening to that. Uh, uh, recording that's coming from turbulent flow. The laminar flow down by the near the alveoli, you're not hearing that. Um, you're hearing the turbulence mostly from the trachea and the bronchi. So why are you listening down here? Right, the trachea and bronchi are up here. So you know you don't really listen up here as a physician because uh, well you do sometimes, but uh, the noise up there is pretty harsh and hollow sound and, and you've got more high frequencies. There's a reason for that. We call that the tubular noises versus the vesicular noises. Um, so if you breathe through your mouth, and just kind of listen to yourself. 
that, that noise, that's kind of what we call a tubular noise. That's coming from the tubes and the trachea and all that. And it's not being muffled by, well, I'm jumping ahead, but uh, it's usually you can't hear those noises. If someone had like a foreign object in there, uh, stuck in their throat, like a kid swallowed something like that, or if there's a tumor pressing on the trachea, then uh, you get even more turbulence because you have the same amount of volume of air, the same mass velocity going through the tube, but now the tube is more constricted. And so uh, it causes more problems. And so that sometimes makes even noises that we call strider. Um, but anyway, in general, the tube of breath sounds are about 300, 800 hertz. And it goes down, here's your trachea dividing the bronchi. And so that region right there, if you listen with the stethoscope, you hear kind of this harsh, like Darth Vader noise. I'll play that for you a little bit. Um, but around this, what's not pictured, is the rest of the lung sac, which has all these alveoli filled with air. And we talked about how sound doesn't go through air as quickly. The air filters out some of the high frequencies. And so when you listen to the chest with the stethoscope, you're hearing noise that starts in the trachea from the turbulence in the trachea and the bronchi. But now it's being transmitted through air. It gets muffled. It becomes more dull. It filters out the high frequency. It's a little quieter. And so uh, uh, that's what we call vesicular sounds as opposed to tubular sounds. The reason that we call vesicular sounds is because Leonek didn't quite understand the anatomy at the time. And he thought that the sound was directly coming from the alveoli, which is we call vesicles. So vesicles are just little small balls, right? So um, he thought that's where the sound was coming from. But it's really all the same source, the tubular versus the vesicular sounds, all the same source, trachea and bronchi, but it's where you're listening to it, what's covering it up. Um, and so, why do you care? Well, what if you didn't have air in your alveoli? What if your alveoli fill, started filling up with liquid of some sort? And that happens. So you can fill up with pus, like from the discharge from the bacteria, from the pneumonia, you have blood seeping in your lung. You can have uh, uh, fluid seep into your lung because of the protein uh, misbalance in your body. You can have the alveoli themselves can collapse and essentially become solid. So if that happens, now you have solid transmitting these tubular sounds from the trachea and the bronchi through your chest out, and it's not air they're blocked anymore, and now they start sounding more clear and harsh. And so, uh, that's when you get what's called the tubular or bronchial sounds, which sound like this. And this sound should sound familiar to any Star Wars fan. Right? It sounds kind of like Darth Vader. This is the sound that your lungs would make if you didn't have air in your alveoli blocking that sound transmission to your stomach. You heard no sound at all. Yeah. Does yeah. that sound similar in the cases of fluid versus collapse? Uh, people will argue a little bit about that, but uh, it's going to sound similar. I'm sure there's people out there that can distinguish between the two. But, uh, there's also the clinical picture you have to be aware of. Uh, but it actually is similar to this point. So if you had a total on collapse, you wouldn't hear any sounds at all, right? But what if you had total fluid flow up there? You wouldn't hear sounds that way either because there's no air going through the fluid. Uh, and so there is a scenario where percussion actually plays a role. And so you are you do need percussive. So in this case, so if your lung collapses, what happens is the lung shrivels up. There's no air keeping it out, and, uh, and so the rest of your chest cavity gets filled with can get filled with air. It can also get filled with fluid. Um, if it's filled with air and you go percuss, you're going to get that hyper-resonant sound that I talked about because there's air. It's like a drum. If there's fluid in there or if there's a tumor or uh, another reason that there's, there could be fluid in the chest cavity is the person doesn't have lung there anymore. Like uh, I got sent in as a med student to a patient and 
I could tell that the, the residents were kind of giggling a little bit when they sent me in. They're like, go examine that patient, tell me what you hear. I go in there and I'm listening to the guy, and I don't hear any breath sounds at all on his left side of his chest. And I'm like, hmm, I'm tapping, and it sounds pretty dull. And I'm like, and he's like looking at me, kind of knowing what I was going to ask. And I'm like, Did you, do you have a left lung? He's like, no, it was removed. So you can remove a lung and people can survive. It's not a deal. What happens when you don't have anything in there? The body starts putting in fluid, it starts building up proteins, and kind of spills up the junk. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a good way to play with the med student's mind. Sitting there and examine people who are missing parts of the body, not tolerant. Uh, so, adventitious lung sounds. Adventitious means unplanned, unexpected, uh, unexpected, kind of from the same group from adventure, right? But in this case, it kind of means extra. So, adventitious lung sounds are lung sounds that you didn't expect to hear. Like the non vesicular, non jugular, the not, the not normal breath sounds. And uh, they basically all come from vibration of the respiratory structures. Um, usually the bronchi or the pleura. The pleura are the, like the lining of the lungs. Um, and the problem with diagnosing them is that you're still hearing the normal breath sounds usually. And so, imagine hearing that kind of Darth Vader sound and you're trying to pick out some of these little smaller sounds underneath that, it becomes kind of difficult. Um, and, led, and then describing them, trying, the part of the reason people dis, uh, disagree is because um, before electronic stethoscopes to have everyone listen to the same exam, everyone was listening with their own stethoscope, with their own kind of, like how these earpieces fit in your ear make a big difference with how you see these little, oh, I didn't pass these around. Pass, Pass these around. This is a, a nice one, a typical one you might see not use. This is a cheap one. Uh, you can kind of compare it. This is one that you might buy and throw away. Um, uh, so this earpiece is the fit in your ear makes a big difference. I don't know if any of you are audiophiles, but the fit in your ear for earbuds is a kind of a big deal of how you listen to things. You know, the true audiophiles don't want earbuds at all, they don't make them. Um, so and then try and describe sounds from that. You know, I had that big list the other day about describing smells and describing colors. Colors are kind of standardized, although I saw a recent article about people trying to cure color blindness with glasses and, and uh, or fix and just, and, uh, and just the person who wrote the article was color blind. And his experience was very subjective. There's a lot of subjectivity. So describing sounds is hard to do. So um, this Lynette described these phrases that he used to describe sounds in her crackling of salt in the heated pan, I mean, who does that? Uh, gurgling of water, chirping of little birds, or the cooing of a wood pigeon. I mean, nowadays, who knows what a wood pigeon, wood pigeon sounds like? Anyone? I don't know. So, uh, uh, so it's problematic. And on top of it is the names that you give to these sounds. So he started labeling these sounds. And for the, a lot of the sounds, he, he was using French for rattle. But because the word uh, for rattle in French is also similar to how we use it in English with death rattle. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but when people are dying, they, they, it, it gets hard for them to clear the, all the mucus and saliva in their mouth, and so they start gargling a little bit. We call that a death rattle. Well, his patients knew that phrase, and so he didn't want to use that phrase around them because they would hear rattle or rail and uh, freak out that he was saying that they were dying. And so he came up with another word. He, he took Latin for rattle, ronca. And so the English translator, Forbes, who thought stethoscopes wouldn't amount to much, uh, he was a little confused by the translate uh, by what uh, Lanyak was trying to say. And so he thought rail and ronca were two different sounds, even though Lanyak thought they were, they were, he was just using the same phrase, uh, uh, the two different words interchangeably. And that has influenced medicine today. Even today, people still people still argue about what a rail is versus a ronca. Um, and uh, in the 70s, they had a big conference and kind of standardized the terminology, but that hasn't completely uh, uh, gotten through all of the medical field. We still hear people argue about how to describe sounds just because of the terminology. So, uh, adventitious sounds. You have basically two types. They call them discontinuous versus continuous. That's not exactly what it sounds like. It just means one's shorter than the other. It's like 250 milliseconds. If it's less than 250 milliseconds, technically you call it a continuous sound. If it's more than 250 milliseconds or a quarter second, you call it a continuous sound. It's not quite continuous. And so you have crackles, 
this is this, the modern terminology, not lay and act, not all the confusing stuff. Modern terminology is uh, crackles, and of crackles, you have the coarse crackles and fine, fine crackles, and then continuous sounds, you have wheezes. That's not quite the wheeze that we think in normal thing language. We'll listen to a wheeze, and you can see that's not what you think of as a wheeze. A wheeze is usually that upper airway sound that someone's trying to hear when they're exercising or something like that, when they're trying to get the air out, because of that turbine, that causes turbulence so in the crazy. And that's, that's not quite the wheeze that we're talking about medically. Um, and then there's plural rubs. So coarse crackles. That's when you have little bubbles in the film of, of the secretions that coat your passageways. And these little bubbles break open. And that sound is what you hear in bronchitis, which is an inflammation of the bronchi. And so you get an inflammation, you get secretions all over the passageway, so there's film there that can pop. And some people describe it as a miniature explosion or uh, this is an older description, taking a lock of your hair and rubbing it by your ear. I've never done that. Uh, more modern ways to describe this, it's kind of like the sound that Velcro makes. Or if you take cellophane or a plastic wrap and kind of crinkle it, that kind of sound. That's a coarse crackle. And this is schematic of, it, it, uh, so you get a bunch of gunk coating your bronchus, and air goes by and pops these little bubbles. It's not the best rendering of it. So uh, let's listen to, when the whole the small passageway, not the bronchus, because the bronchus, if you close down, you have problems. But uh, the smaller passages is deeper. If they were to close shut and then pop open again, that's going to make some sound. And so they might close shut because there's a lot of pressure. Interstitial pressure refers to the pressure in the interspe interspecies. So your material science session has to explain the interstitial ones. But it's the pressure outside of the, 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 the airway. It's around the airway. And it pushes on the airway closes it down. So that could happen if you have scarring in the, the lung tissue called pulmonary fibrosis, or if you have fluid or pus or serum pushing, uh, collecting or pushing, causing pressure on these little passageways, closing them up. And then you get, take a nice breath, and it, air comes through and pops them open. So the schematic, uh, not the best rendering, but uh, you get the idea. So let's listen to fine crackles. So that's why you call them fine. They're higher pitch. It's coming from a smaller uh, air passageway. Well, that part of here is my crackles. The wheezes. Wheezes and bronchi, the modern definition of bronchi. They're the same thing, it's just what pitch they are. So, uh, Higher frequency the wheezes, lower frequency the wrong kind. Um, the you might they come from going air going through a tube, right? And so if you heard it, you know, we'll we'll play I'll play a sound. You think it's, they, people describe it as musical, so it kind of sounds like air being blown through, like say a pipe organ, but that's not what's happening. So a pipe organ to get the same pitch that the wheezes would would have to be like 48 feet long, and your whole bronchial tree is like a foot. So that's obviously not, not what is happening. Also, if you breathe helium, the pitch of your voice changes because the, the air going past your laryngeal cords is now helium. Um, transfers sound differently. Put helium in a pipe organ, which I'd love to see, but it would change the pitch. But if someone breathes helium, uh, uh, the wheeze pitch doesn't change. So it's not a air making the sound. It's actually, uh, uh, more like if you a reed instrument. So if you blow on a reed instrument, it's the vibration of the reed that's making the sound. Or if you let air out of the balloon, you're stretching the, the air's coming out, but it's really the vibration of the, the mouth there. And so that's similar to what's happening. It's fluttering of the airway wall. So 
you get uh, uh, secretions that, or, or the airway gets occluded in some way, like from a tree, <coughs> or if your bronchial, the bronchial tree is spasming, like tightening up because you have on, like uh, asthma or something like that, um, then the air coming through can actually suck the passage close a little bit. Can you think of something where air passages causes suction? You drive it in every day. Actually, nowadays they may not have this. The older engines have this. So in your throttle, what pulls the, the air in? Bernoulli principle. Think about that. Engines. So when you have air flowing through a tube and there's a little hole in the tube, air flowing through a tube will cause a suction into the hole, right? From the passage. That's the Bernoulli principle. And so uh, this happens. In the wheezes, uh, the when the tubes are narrow, the air is coming through, but there's no air, there's no hole for air to get in to cause the suction, and so it just collapses the tube because the tube's not rigid. And so when it collapses, uh, air stops going through, stop the vacuum or the, the pressure differential stops, the airway opens up again. So you have this this fluttering airway, and that makes noise. That's kind of a schematic. A narrow, narrow, uh, normal airway, normal, nothing's going on. It starts to narrow, you're starting to get a pressure decrease, and it causes more narrowing, and it starts fluttering back and forth. And this is more of a remarkable sound. That's a wheeze in a medical sense. Uh, that's the whale on uh, the boy home or whatever. <laughs> or it's a whale. Yeah. So this is a lower pitch. So you can see that how, how someone can call it a crackle. You get people arguing about these things. Um, plural rubs, uh, so the pleura are linings of organs. And so your lung has a lining, a pleural lining around the lung, and then your chest wall has a pleural lining itself. So you have two pleura, and there's a little bit of liquid in between, and that allows, it's just the cushion or the, the, the uh, it allows for friction. You know, it's, it's allowing a smooth, uh, a frictionless passageway between the lung and the chest wall so that they can move past each other. Well, if you have some inflammation that can cause some stickiness, they can actually rub, and it's like tissue rubbing against each other, like leather rubbing against each other. And it's kind of distinctive. Um, I hear this in cancer patients a number of times, sometimes with them. sound that you hear uh, is sounds coming from your voice. It's kind of a no-brainer. But again, you have all this air that's filtering out high frequencies, right? So your voice can make sound, it's transferred in the chest, but if you're listening through your chest wall, then uh, it, uh, it changes what it sounds like. And as it so happens, vowels are particularly affected. The vowels are critical to language. So if you listen, I don't know if you've ever had them laying on someone's chest and listen had to talk, it's like, oh, 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 oh. it's like Charlie Brown's teacher. That's because the, the high pitch frequencies are getting filtered out, and that's destroying the comprehension of vowels, mostly. All vowels start to sound like A's. Oh, 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 oh. That's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Oh, oh, oh. It's like, ah. Oh. Whereas, like, uh, they, they started out sounding like an E or an O or U, it all sounds like an A. That messes up with how it sounds. Um, if you take a patient who has some kind of consolidation of liquid or fluid in the chest and you have them say a word and you're listening with a stethoscope and if you can understand what they're saying, then you're like, oh, there's a problem. That's why it's got a glass of food. Interesting. Um, I mentioned the E to the A. It became like a, a certain type of test, but it's kind of funny how it developed. It's a quick story. Uh, like many weird medical stories, it starts out with a, some British missionary somewhere in some far-flung country, in this case China, 
and he was having his patients count one, two, three when he was listening to their chest, because that's how he was trained to do it. That's how his initial technique was developed. It's like have them count, or actually they also have them count to say uh, the word 99 in German, but anyway, uh, he was having count one, two, three, but in Mandarin, and in Mandarin, I don't speak Mandarin, but it's basically ER sign or something like that. And so that first sound, one, sounded like to him, like they were saying the letter E. And when he was listening to their chest, it sounded like the letter A. And so that became a doctor and gave him the medical knowledge. And people talk about having to do the E to A test, but it's not anything magical. It's just, it's a vowel. It sounds like a vowel. So that's your homework, is lay on a family member's chest or friend who's okay with that. And listen to them talk. <laughs> Fermentist is something else. It's not quite listening, but you can feel vibration in your chest when people talk to you with yourself right now. And that changes if uh, there's some kind of consolidation or abnormality, and the, if so, it, it feels less like a palpable feel. So, in summary, uh, sound density are related. Uh, turbulence equals sound. If you want to maintain distance, use tubes. And, if anyone hears people talk about the inner technique, if you ever heard that the internet is a series of tubes, then maybe that means it. But uh, I use the internet for tables, so that's my joke. And so next time, I guess that's tomorrow, I'll talk about hard sounds. Questions? Okay. Go.